It's a good song. Uh, two days from now, the 14th of June, will mark 50 years, the 50th anniversary, of a little boy named Dennis Martin who disappeared in the Smoky Mountains. A number of people have disappeared, but this is the strangest of all the cases because his dad was there and it's just a place called Spence Field. They were playing hide and seek and so forth. And the little boy came up missing and never showed, never nothing from that moment on. And these, uh, I didn't know this, but his family lived right here in Knoxville. I thought they'd been visiting from somewhere, but no, they lived right here. And uh, until the day he died, I'm sure that this father uh, wondered where his little boy was. Fine looking little boy. He came up missing all of a sudden. How do you live with that? I don't know. I have no idea. But it kind of gives you an idea tonight of what can happen in this world. Hey, Amen. It can happen. I don't know of anything worse than to lose one of your children like that. That's horrible. I first came to Temple in 1976. Uh, the following year, 1977, a young girl was with her team, her, with a group from her high school. Her name was Trini Gibson. Trini Gibson came up missing. She was on a trail. All of a sudden, she comes up missing. Her dad and mother came to this church after the event, later. Her mother's name was Hope, real fine woman. I talked to her a number of times about that. They never, she never, they never found Trini. No, no indication of what happened to her. She just came up missing, like the mountains just swallowed them up. And they've been over there, they've looked, they've hunted, they've looked, they've hunted. I think something like 1,300 people showed up after little, little Dennis Martin came up missing. For days they hunted and hunted and hunted and hunted, and to no avail. But this is the 50th anniversary of that, the 14th day of June, 1969 this happened. Pray for these people. Would you do that? Because I'm sure there's some of the family members left. It'd still be wonderful if they found out something, even after all these years, if they found something, knew something about what happened to their little boy. That would be, that's awful. That's terrible. Well, it's good to be here tonight, folks. Amen. God's been good to me. Amen. I had one little girl, December the 18th, 1969. She showed up and she's still here. And then I've had three little girls show up from her, and they're still here. And my, 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 uh, my oldest granddaughter will be turning 26. Can you believe that in August? That's my granddaughter. So how old does that make me? <laughs> <coughs> Turn the book of Exodus chapter 12 with me tonight. <clears throat> and verse 12. <clears throat> Exodus 12, 12. Exodus chapter number 12 and verse 12. The Lord said, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am Jehovah. I am the Lord. Father, bless your word and anoint this messenger. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to call your attention to what... Uh, What's going on here? God said, I will execute judgment on Egypt's gods. And Egypt had plenty of them. They had plenty of gods. All kinds of gods. They had weird gods, strange gods. But the Egyptians were very, 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 very religious people. Very, very advanced people for their time. They built monuments that still stand thousands of years later. The Egyptian hieroglyphics were an enigma. Nobody could understand them. Nobody could read them until Jean-Claude Champollion under, uh, under Napoleon in the early 1800s found a stone. They found a stone in Rosetta, Egypt called the Rosetta Stone. And it had about four or five different languages and it had Egyptian hieroglyphics and it had demotic. And he, smart, very brilliant man, was able to decipher the Egyptian hieroglyphics from the stone, the Rosetta Stone, and when he did that, Egyptology was born because then they could read what the pharaohs had said and what they'd said thousands of years ago and got into all of that and, and, uh, and the story, of course, goes on. This is an advanced civilization, far advanced civilization. fact of the matter is, 
That civilization is more advanced than some of them around today. That's a very advanced civilization. Yet they were very religious people. The reason they were religious because they didn't know the truth. They were in darkness, and so they had to deal with, with, uh, with trying to understand Almighty God. The Lord said, I'm going to execute judgment on the gods of the Egyptians. You know how he did that. He brought plagues in there, and he plagued each one of them. The Nile River, for example, was turned into blood, and the Nile River they worshipped because it brought life to them. So he turned it into blood. He, uh, he judged the frogs, the frog god. If you'll look in the book of Revelation, you'll find there's a connection between frogs and demons. He judged the lice, the god of Ged, the god called Ged, the earth god. So therefore, the lice, like the sand or like the dust of the earth, he's showing them how that he's cursed that. He cursed all their gods. Flies. This is one of the gods that he judged, and that's Beelzebub in the Bible. And then cattle. The scripture says that he, he judged the cattle, he cursed the, uh, the cattle. And if you'll notice in the book of Ezekiel chapter number 1 and verse 10, turn there with me tonight. I want you to notice something very, very peculiar about this. If you remember back in the book of Genesis when the serpent uh, had, uh, had, had uh, deceived Eve and Adam uh, with his eyes wide open decided to stay with Eve... Uh, the scripture says, God said to the serpent, you are cursed above all cattle. That's quite remarkable. Look at Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side. They four had the face of an ox on the left side and also the face of an eagle. Now hold your place there and turn to Ezekiel chapter number 10, verse 14. I want to show you how that comparing Scripture with Scripture, it begins to yield something for us. We've got Ezekiel 1.10. We have these cherubim, and that's what they are. They come down, these spirit creatures, and they are manifesting the glory of God. We have a, we have a, uh, we have a movable throne to let them understand. Ezekiel is a captivity book. So they'll understand that even though Israel is in captivity, God is still the sovereign and nothing has changed about that. So here in Ezekiel chapter number 10 and verse 14, look at this carefully. And everyone had four faces. The first face with the face of a cherub. The second face with the face of a man. The third face, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. What's the difference between the two scriptures? There's one thing that's different. That's exactly right. The ox in chapter number 1 verse number 10 is called the cherub in chapter number 10 verse 14. The face of a cherub, the ox. Think about that for a moment. Thou art cursed above all cattle, God said to the serpent. Now, of course, I'm not going to get into all that tonight because that's not part of the message. But I want you to think about it. Just put it away in the back of your mind because the ox is connected with the cherub. What nation has the sacred cow? You can see the Indians in India, of course. You can see them starving to death, and yet you can see the cattle just wandering around, walking around on the streets. They're called the sacred cow. They, they believe in reincarnation. They believe in karma over there. That's part of Buddhism, part of Hinduism. And so they believe in all of that. That's to me and to you, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, it's just a bunch of superstition. But the scripture has something to say about cattle. But in any event, the boils, the Bible says, they had boils come upon them. Check Revelation out. Thunder and hail, check out the book of Revelation. Locust, check Revelation chapter number 9. Darkness, check that out in the book of Revelation. And then the death of the firstborn, the pride and strength of Egypt. In plain words, when God judged the gods of Egypt, he essentially was giving a preview of what he's going to do in the tribulation period. It's a preview. Because he's going to judge the gods of this world again. And he's going to take the kingdoms of this world and he will take them by force. They will never be given to him. What is rightfully his, man will never give to God. So when he comes back, he comes back as a man of war. He comes back on a white horse. He's got a sword. And the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that the blood runs as high as a horse's bridle. When this battle takes place, and it's the battle of Armageddon. Ar in Hebrew means mountain. 
So it's the mountain of Megiddo. How many of you know where Megiddo is? It's in the northern part of Israel. It has a, a huge uh, plain in front of it. It's called the plain of Megiddo or the plain of Esdraelon. And in the past, some uh, generals and some uh, war planners have stood at the top of Megiddo and they've looked down at that and they said that is a natural battlefield. If there ever was one, that is a natural battlefield. You could go to the other side of the plain of Esdraelon and go up to climb the, climb the incline and guess what town is sitting there? Nazareth. As a boy, he could look down through the trees upon the very valley that when he comes back as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he'll be doing battle. Amen. So we read here how God judged the gods of Egypt. I want you to look at some things about this, though. He's reaching Pharaoh. Look at Exodus chapter number 5, verses 1 and 2. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in, told Pharaoh, Thus saith Jehovah, keep this in mind, it's important in the context. This is the God of Israel judging the gods of Egypt. And his name is Jehovah. See this capital L-O-R-D? Printer's type. How many of you have capital L-O-R-D? That means that it's yod Hey vau Hey, the tetragrammaton. It's Jehovah. I know there's a lot of Yahweh going on today, but I've never jumped on the Yahweh bandwagon. I still believe in Jehovah. But in any event, those, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, now watch this, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? There's nothing like being honest. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. I appreciate his honesty because there's an awful lot of people out there that feel the same way. Who is your God? Who is the Lord? Who is Jesus? Who is your God? I don't know your God. He told the truth. He didn't know him. But he's manifesting his pride. He said, I don't know the Lord. In Proverbs chapter number 21 and verse 1, it says this, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, Jehovah. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Nothing's changed. He still can. He worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Just because you're a monarch sitting on a throne doesn't mean the Almighty can't turn you any way he pleases. Look at Daniel chapter number 4, verse 24, and you'll see an, uh, you'll see an incident of this. Daniel 4, 24. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which is come upon my Lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and, thy, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, the ox. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. And seven times, seven years, shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Amen. Boy, who's he talking to? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He certainly is. And for seven years, he lived as a wild man out here in the peripheral, in the netherworld. Did you know the book of Job talks about wild men driven from men that live out in the netherworld, that live out in the forest and the woods, hairy men? Did you know that when David in the Old Testament uh, came up against Goliath, that Goliath's brethren had six fingers, six toes? Did you know the Bible talked about lion-like men? does you mean the bible talks about these things sure it does the word of god is a strange thing when it gets to some of this stuff it mentions it sometimes it doesn't get into detail but the pride of pharaoh was his downfall he mocks look at exodus chapter number five and verse nine let their more work be laid upon the men that they may labor therein and let them not regard vain words when they came to him and said uh, would you please ease the burden on us? Instead of easing the burden, he increased the burden and said that your words that you hear from your God are vain, empty words. Well, the Lord's about to show him they're not vain and they're not empty. Amen. But he spent his time mocking. Proverbs chapter number one, verse 24 says this, because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your 
calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. So if you want to mock God, you know, and say that, you know, the man upstairs is not going to tell me how to live and so forth and so on, then your words will come back upon your head. The Bible says plainly, God is not mocked. He's obstinate. In the book of Exodus chapter number 5 and verse 2, note carefully now, And Pharaoh said, Who is Jehovah? Who is the Lord? That I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Who is he? The old, uh, it's been said that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the composers walked out into the rain, he lifted up his hand, shook his fist into heaven, into the face of God, and said, there is no God, there is no God, there's no God, this is all a fairy tale, there is no God. And then the lightning struck real right near to him. And first thing you know, he was down on his knees crying out to God because he thought he was about to die. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> there is no God as long as, you're, as long as you're healthy. You let a bolt of lightning. <laughs> I mean, it literally burns the air, folks. It vaporizes the air. So he's obstinate. Look at Exodus chapter number 7, verse 13. Pharaoh, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, this is one of the hardest things about the Bible. People have so much trouble with this scripture. Let's try to deal with it tonight. He hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. All right? Time and again, they went before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, uh, being a human being and being, uh, you know, didn't want like his comfort uh, 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 invaded, uh, would, would allow something to happen. The book of Acts chapter number 16, verse 14, the scripture says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Did you see this now? On one hand, he hardeneth who he will harden. On the other hand, he openeth. He opened her heart. Now, he gives a warning in Hebrews chapter number 3. It might be good for you to turn there and look at this with me tonight. Hebrews chapter number 3 and verse 7. Here's a warning. God's a good God. Not willing that any should perish. That includes Pharaoh. And that all should come to repentance. That includes Pharaoh. But Hebrews chapter number 3 and verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Now you all know that. You've read your Bible. You know how that Israel mumbled and they griped and they complained. And even when he fed them with manna. What did they say about the manna? Yeah, we loathe this light bread. We want meat. And so what did God do? He gave them meat. What did he do? He sent the quail. And when the quail came, they were, they were that deep. And they ate, and they ate meat, and they ate meat. But boy, I tell you, the Old Testament, God has a way sometimes of just absolutely. You know what he did with those that had the meat in their mouth, that had, the, had, had so much meat in their mouth? How many of you remember reading that? He smote them. He did. He smote them. He smote them. So harden not your hearts as in the provocation. In the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. That's a long time. That's a whole generation. And every last one of them died except Joshua and Caleb. Exactly. A new generation came on. They're kids. And they were able to go in the promised land. But that generation, that Kadesh Barnea, that rejected the promise of God because of the giants in the land at, uh, at Hebron, they rejected, they rejected God's promise. 
And because of that, they were wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. What a sad thing. But now look at verse number 9 again. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. One of the most blessed things you'll ever learn in life is to learn the ways of God. You'll have mercy on people you think you'd never have mercy on. You'll see people get right with God you never thought they'd ever get right with God. You'll see people turn their back on the Lord and walk out the church door and they'll never come back again. And they're the last ones you thought would ever do that. About the time you think you've got people figured out, you're going to, it's going to blow up in your face. It's just it's an enigma wrapped in a riddle. <laughs> It's just one of the hardest things in the world to understand. But here's what he said in verse 8. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, the day of temptation, the wilderness. What do I mean then? It means that God makes a declaration. It's up to you to receive it or reject it. By rejecting the truth, your heart becomes harder. Light rejected, as the old timers used to say, becomes lightning. Yes. Light rejected becomes lightning. Truth rejected hardens the heart. Amen. And of course, when, you've, when you're like, how's God going to lead you? When you've got a hard heart, a heart of unbelief, then you're in bad shape. So a hardened heart. Look at this repentance from Pharaoh and give an idea of what's going on. Look at Exodus chapter number 9, verse 26. Now, you, you've seen people like him. I guarantee it you've met him. You know him. Exodus chapter 9, verse 26. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And, and I'll tell you the truth. You get out here and you start looking at maps. There's a Goshen, Alabama. There's Goshens everywhere, all, all over this country. You'd be amazed how many Goshens out there. Folks like that name, Goshen, because of what happened down there in Egypt. Now look at this. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail? And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Man, is that the truth? Sure, it's the truth. Where did it come from, though? That's the key to understanding relationship with God. Where did that truth come from? Did it come from up here or down here? Makes all the difference in the world, folks. Look at chapter number 9, verse 34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. See there? What happens? When the problem is gone, when the pressure's relieved, when things change, what happens? All of a sudden, he's right back where he started from. Why? Because his sinning and all of this came from his head, not from the heart. There was no repentance. He told the truth. You're righteous and we're wicked. That's the truth. Amen, Pharaoh. <laughs> Preach on, son. I agree with you. But the problem is, I say it from here. Pharaoh said it from here. And there's a big difference between the two. Look at Exodus chapter number 10, verse 16. Exodus 10, 16. It's a remarkable thing here. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Therefore, forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once. Now look at this. And entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. Man, he's asking for intercessory prayer. He knows Moses has power with God. He said, you're God. And he's honest again. Have you noticed the honesty of Pharaoh? It wasn't Pharaoh's God. It was Moses' God. And he said, please entreat for me. <coughs> Call upon him. 
Did it do him any good? And so what did God do? He came through at midnight and he smote the strength of Egypt, firstborn, of every house. We don't realize today how important firstborn is in the Bible. It's a different study. I already had a thing worked up on that, but God led me in this direction tonight. Firstborn is a big deal. Very big deal. The Lord Jesus is called the firstborn of all creation. The Bible says he's the firstborn of the dead. First one to rise from the dead, never to die again. That we are tonight part of the church of the firstborn. First ones to be born of the spirit of the living God. Pharaoh's firstborn son. You'd better hug him, Pharaoh. You better pull him close to you. Because he doesn't have much time left in this world. When Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh, God told them to say something to Pharaoh that they never did. If they ever said it, it's not written in the Bible. They only said part of what God told them to do. Let my people go, they said. Let Israel go. Let my son go. Israel is my firstborn. Let him go. Now that opens up an entirely new study because Israel's the firstborn nation, firstborn people, see? But they didn't say that to Pharaoh. But think about what happened. The firstborn of Pharaoh in place of the firstborn of God, see? Israel is the firstborn of God. Pharaoh's firstborn perished. When we compare firstborns, we have to compare the authority and strength that upholds them. I'm glad tonight for the one who upholds me. We are upheld by the power of God. He's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. The wicked one cannot touch us, but he'd like to. Believe me, he'd like to. And if he decides that you are important enough, he'll approach the Lord and say, Would you mind giving me just a little while with him? Because he did with Peter. He came to the Lord and said, I'd like to have Peter for just a little while. And I'll show you what Peter, what Pete's made out of. And the Lord said, Peter, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. There's that intercession again. And then he said, when thou art what? Converted, strengthen thy brethren. That's quite a thing. Have you been converted? Have you been healed? You have been healed. My soul's been healed. I've been saved. I'm a church of the firstborn. Does that mean, what does that mean in relation? It means that the first ones born of the Spirit of God is the church for the last 2,000 years. But it implies that there will be second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh on down the line. There will be more, and there will be. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you for the scripture. Thank you for the infallible text. And bless them tonight and help them. In Jesus' name, amen.